Welcome back to Florida Panhandle Technical College and part three of Photography 101. Today, we'll demystify exposure by working with ISO, aperture, and shutter speed. We started off this series by talking about the large number of DSLR cameras in closets and carports all over due to the sharp learning curve when trying to master exposure, especially when dealing in manual mode with ISO, aperture, and shutter speed. Let's take a closer look at what we mean when we say exposure and demystify these functions. ISO, aperture, and shutter speed all control light coming into the camera and they must all work together to get proper exposure. Exposure is the amount of light reaching a photographic film or electronic image sensor as determined by shutter speed, lens aperture, and scene luminance, which we'll refer to as ISO. Light is referred to and measured by increments, known as f-stops or simply stops of light. And if you can multiply by or divide by two, this becomes relatively easy to understand. ISO determines the sensitivity of the camera's sensor and varies from 100 to 100,000. Starting with an ISO of 100, light is doubled with each stop. So an ISO of 200 allows twice as much light as an ISO of 100. And an ISO of 800 allows twice as much light as an ISO of 400. The stop progression for a DSLR is 100, 200, 400, 800, 1600, 3200, 6400, and so on. An ISO of 100 is typically a good starting place when you have a well-lit or exterior location, as it allows the minimum amount of light into the DSLR sensor, whereas a starting ISO of 500 might be appropriate in a shady location, or 1600 in an interior room, and so on. For high school basketball in a poorly lit gymnasium, it's not unusual to use an ISO of 10,000 or more. As an analogy, we can use the example of you waking up in the middle of the night to get a drink of water. Your eyes are sensitive from being closed and easily overwhelmed by the bright light. If your ISO is set too high, your camera reacts in much the same way, and the resulting photo can be overexposed with lots of artifacts or noise. Aperture refers to the size of the opening in the lens of the camera and is similar to the iris of the eye. Aperture controls light coming into the camera and is measured in stops starting with F1 through F22. Aperture also controls depth of field or the amount of the photo that will be in focus, but we'll circle back to that in a bit. The larger the aperture or lens opening, the smaller the number, I know, sort of backwards, and the more light enters the camera. Here's where you'll have to memorize a few numbers. We use what we call true stops, and these are F1, F1.4, F2, F2.8, F4, F5.6, F8, F11, F16, and F22. These are referred to as true stops because as you go up or down the scale, you either multiply by two or divide by two the amount of light coming into the camera. Therefore, an aperture of f1 allows twice as much light to enter the camera as an aperture of f1.4, and an aperture of f11 allows half the amount of light of an aperture of f8. Depth of field refers to the amount of the subject in focus, with a wide aperture or small number having a shallow or narrow depth of field. This means that the subject's in focus while anything in front of or behind the subject is not. A deep depth of field caused by a small aperture is just the opposite, with pretty much everything in the photo being in focus. Shutter speed is controlled by the camera and determines how long the shutter will stay open when you take a photo. Shutter speed can vary from 1 8,000th of a second to 30 seconds, controls how much light comes into the camera, and freezes motion. A slow shutter speed allows blurring of the subject when in motion, whereas a fast shutter speed allows you to freeze motion as long as you have enough light. ISO, aperture, and shutter speed work hand in hand in harmony to provide a well-exposed photograph. When you're prepared to take a photo, you simply take into account the amount of ambient light available, 
Whether you want a deep depth of field with everything in focus or a shallow depth of field with that pleasing creamy bokeh in the background, and whether there's any action to freeze or simply motion to blur. By taking all of this into account, it's fairly straightforward to get a well-exposed photo. In part four of this series, we'll put all of these factors into action to get that properly exposed photograph.